Welcome to our introduction of our last and final unit, The Age of Imperialism. Let's get into it. So with The Age of Imperialism, this kind of ends our last uh, unit of History 10. I think it sets us up for a world that uh, combined with our understanding of um, the, uh, the rise in nationalism, which we looked at last unit, uh, will set you up for the world of World War I. And then uh, you can pick it up from there in History 20. So that's why this is all necessary background info here. Now, with the age of imperialism, uh, we are going to kind of look not so much at what's going on in Europe, but rather how is Europe having an impact on global situations and global affairs through what we call imperialism. So let's get through uh, this introduction. You can read along. Again, uh, highlight the important significant ideas, things that you haven't heard of before, concepts that are unfamiliar to you. And then as we come back to these ideas uh, through the unit, uh, you will hopefully come to an understanding of them. Uh, this handout's a little different. It gives you an idea or definition of colonialism, um, European behavior in the world at the time, and then some examples of imperialism. And we're going to take a look at a little bit more of a generalized, broader look at uh, European and American colonialism in the late parts of the 1800s. All right, so let's get into looking up here. So uh, imperialism is tied closely to colonialism. Colonialism was actually nothing necessarily new, as we know that people in Europe were setting up colonies in North America, uh, Australia, etc., cetera, uh, many centuries before this. The French were, you know, the British were, America had already been founded by the 13 colonies. So colonialism kind of extends from that idea. It's just a more modern colonialism. It's one that happens in the 1800s. So by the late 1800s, the British Empire and other European powers were racing to establish colonies around the world, mainly in Africa. So our situation is going to dwell on Africa. As we know, a colony is a small foreign territory run by people from a mother country. We've seen colonies in those examples I've just mentioned uh, in, in the past, the things that founded Canada, for instance, or the 13 colonies of the United States. The colonies were primarily established in order to gain access to trade routes, okay, as well as to gain access to raw materials, and to attempt to create new markets for European goods. Again, being Canadians, this should all be familiar to us. The fact that Canada was deemed worthy of colonization was because of resources and raw materials, primarily furs and the fur trade. So it's a great example of colonialism and the, the, the function of setting up a colony, usually for an economic profit for the mother country. Okay. Now, most often, colonies were not needed by native peoples to bring order to foreign areas. They were native peoples. They had their own societies. They did not need European intervention. Most often, or sorry, native peoples had their own ways of life, as well as their own cultures and traditions and languages. Many times there were native forms of government already established in areas where colonies, colonists attempted to settle or claim. Just look at the 13 colonies and the first interactions between Europeans and, and American Indians, for instance. Sometimes this brought conflict between colonists and native populations, but unsurprisingly, it was rarely the native peoples who came out on top, as they were up against powerful European nations who had achieved a much higher level of industrialization, technology, um, and firepower, military. And as a result, you have the domination of Europeans. Okay? Now, we're dealing with the continent of Africa, but a lot of these same things, we can go back centuries and see it already happening in North South America, uh, in India, as we'll see uh, down here a little bit. Um, so that's in a nutshell, the motivating factor behind empire, uh, imperialism and the establishment of European empires. So a lot more details that we'll go into when we look at our chapters. So there are some examples of imperialism we'll take a look at. One is a specific example of the Zulu War in Africa. And so we go right into Africa here. 
In, uh, and by the way, at the very end of this uh, page is a map that points to where these incidents are happening. So we're going to look at the Zulu Wars. We're going to look at the Sepoy Rebellion and the Boxer Rebellion in China uh, and in India here. So that's where those take place. You can consult that map as we are talking about these. So... In 1879, the British Empire, like many other countries at this time, turned to Africa as a wide open free for all area. At this time, the rest of the world had really been under the control of other empires and other countries and nations. Okay, North America was independent. I mean, Canada had 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 gained its uh, dominion status by this point too. So it's not like it's not like there are many territories up for grabs anymore in the world. But Africa is, all right? Uh, this, uh, okay, uh, for area to expand its empire with colonies and to expand trade. This massive push for imperialistic countries to establish colonies in Africa was known as the scramble for Africa. We'll get into that. The British also declared a forward policy, claiming that they would continue to expand their empire. So while the British are kind of letting go elements of their empire, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, uh, they are also uh, obtaining territories to expand their empire. So the British, already having a colony in southern Africa, looked to Zululand of southeastern Africa as a good ground for British rule. However, the land was already under the rule of the native African Zulu kingdom. This was a self-supporting kingdom that lay on the eastern coast of Africa. The British wanted this area since it would make trade and transportation easier for them. Commander Frere immediately considered the Zulu a threat towards British colonization and went to war with the idea that he would quickly put down the Zulu, who fought with mere shields and spears. So uh, we get kind of this, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Avatar. If you haven't, maybe check it out or, or look at the review or something. Uh, but you have a civilization that is very uh, kind of traditional, tied to the land, not sophisticated, not industrialized, uses spears and shields, uh, going up to war against the British firepower. Now, the Zulu do put up more resistance than anticipated, killing 1,300 British soldiers in the beginning, what's known as the Zulu Wars. The British respond quickly by reasserting their power, and they were able to push back the Zulu closer to their capital, Yulundi. Upon reaching Yulundi, the British burnt down the city, defeated the Zulu, and immediately divided up the area into 13 British sections. Uh, when foreign powers came to, into control, like they did in Africa with the Zulu, the native peoples often became upset with their new government, yet Europeans were more powerful and were thirsting to expand their empires by conquering vast areas over the whole African continent. And this example goes to show uh, how the British dealt with the Zulu, how that conflict resulted. Uh, but this is just one example of hundreds through Africa as Europeans are doing much the same thing with other African peoples um, uh, at this time. And they're carving up Africa for themselves, planting their flag and expanding their territories, their empire territories. Okay. Now, in, again, this is nothing new for the British so much. The Spanish, even the French had territories. Okay, for a lot of other European nations, this is kind of them measuring up to the history, especially that the British had uh, of their global empire and the economic wealth that that seemed to bring the British, bring uh, to the British compared to those other countries. All right, we go to Indi India again. This is another example uh, concerning the British. Now we go back far here because India was um, uh, a colony or an economic uh, place controlled by Britain. Uh, many, like many, many years before here. And there's a lot of similarities between the Hudson's Bay Company and uh, the founding of Canada and the roots of India being um, uh, overseen by the East India Company. This is a company. This is an economic venture by, uh, Europe, by British capitalists. So by 1757, the British transitioned the East India Company into a form of British imperialism or control of India. So it's not just a company, it's the way that the British kind of has this oversight over the, uh, the rule of the territory of India. Now, the expansion of this company upset Indians as they felt it would erase Indian culture and replace it with British European culture. By the way, when we talk about Indian, 
we talk and sometimes we say East Indian to refer to, um, to people from India, but people from India are Indian. Okay. So that's kind of the national, uh, uh, how, how you express that identity. So East India Company was composed mainly of Indians. These recruits came to be known as Sepoys and acted under the service of British Company, um, uh, the East Indian Company. The Sepoys received poor pay as well as lower positions due to their ethnicity. Okay. Over time, the Sepoys grew more and more dissatisfied with their pay and their treatment. They could tell that their best interests were not being thought of by the British rulers. The Sepoys were also upset that the traditional Hindu or Muslim cultures were not being respected. There's this tiny rumor going about the Sepoys that the British were supplying them with weapon cartridges greased with animal fat. And they were military guys and they would carry, you know, they would help. They were like the police, whatnot. And uh, so they so they heard this rumor. Oh, this is produced with animal fat. Well, cows were sacred to Hindus and pigs were unclean to Muslims. So either way, you're kind of interfering with that cultural belief. And it's very, very severe, serious to them. Naturally, the Sepoys were upset. So to rebel against the British, the Sepoys refused to use these items that were made from these animals. The Sepoys began to fight back against the British in a form of mutiny, which is called the Sepoy Rebellion. And this happens in 1857. So time passes as this kind of under, um, uh, undermining uh, discontent with the Sepoys, so that by 1857, it, it peaks. Uh, by the way, 1857 is around that same time that countries in uh, uh, Europe are, are, uh, are responding to nationalism and beginning to unite, like we talked about last unit. After intense and often savage fighting, the British decided it would be better to give in to some of India's requests. The British agreed to act with religious toleration of the Muslims and Hindu ways. They would no longer exploit the resources they obtained from Indian lands, and Indians would be allowed to uh, work civil positions, though often still subordinate or inferior to the uh, British. What the Indians achieved here was a small victory that would eventually lead to their own independence from their European imperialists, Okay, and that would happen a little bit more in time. So India actually comes off uh, here a little bit in a better situation, but they have, remember, a couple centuries of history under British influence. And it takes some time for them to, again, kind of garner their own nationalism and eventually gain their own independence and still ruled um, and dominated by their own peoples. And that's a different situation than Canada. Um, and a different situation than some of Africa. Um, but typically today, you have co the country of, of India still being primarily occupied by the Indian ethnicity. Or you have countries in Africa primarily occupied by people of African ethnicity. Um, in Canada, it's different. Canada and the United States is different. You don't have, you know, a modern Canada or a modern United States occupied primarily by its former native inhabitants. Um, on the contrary, you have a, a story that's a lot different. Uh, just to look at this from a comparison perspective, that uh, North America had been filled with European immigrants largely and uh, early on, now international immigrants, so that the dominating population is not the one that is natively there. Okay. So that's India. India eventually grows to uh, its own independence, um, as will a lot of these other African countries, as we'll see by the end of the unit. And then, of course, there's the Boxer Rebellion in China. So in China, believe it or not, China was also a, a country dominated by European economic economists, econ economicists at the time. Uh, for oh man, the sheer the sheer market that China provided. Uh, to European goods and manufacturing. Now, interest, ironically, isn't it the opposite now where China is the dominant producer, economic producer of goods for the world? Whereas at this point in time, they were like the prime consumer of European imp uh, industrialized manufacture of goods and such. Okay. By 1800s, uh, China and Africa was divided into many different European colonies or territories. Now, wanting independence for the Chinese people, em uh, Chinese Empress Tzu He He's of the Qing Dynasty in 1900 created a group known as the Boxers. This is a little bit more recent history, but 120 years ago, who were dedicated to pushing out foreign rule and ending Chinese exploitation by, Chinese, uh, by European imperialists. The group, this 
boxers group, uh, was able to sack the city of Beijing, what's called the Boxer Rebellion, and gain it. Unfortunately, with many different European powers present in the area, uh, they all had economic interests and they needed to, they needed to protect. So they needed to reoccupy Beijing uh, or re- have take, overtake their influence uh, of Beijing again. An international, this is interesting, an international army then reacts quickly against the boxers, backed by European military superiority. And, I, that's, and that's what it was, okay? With troops from Russia, Japan, which we see as Japan, uh, why is Japan in here? Because it was an, in, an imperial power. It was an industrialized country already by this time modeled after that of Europe. Britain, America, Germany, France, Austria, and Italy, okay? This nationalist boxer movement was quickly put down, and the foreign powers presented present established a centralized government in Beijing. Unfortunately for China, a concession was that the foreign troops be permitted to be stationed on Chinese soil, and interestingly up to our own, you know, the last century, that we still have European occupation of territory in China itself, Okay. Uh, some interesting questions to think about in the basis of this uh, Boxer Rebellion and the gradual move towards uh, independence and communism in China, even to this day. So European peoples from Europe are dabbling in conquering territories and setting up European empires uh, and competing with one another, chop up Africa, places in Asia, etc. Uh, at, at, uh, in a new way during the 1800s uh, and leading up to the uh, events of World War One, where these countries still have international territories um, kind of all around the world. Very interesting. I hope you stay tuned and enjoy our unit on the, what is it called again? Age of imperialism. Don't be lame. DBL guys.